Hello, and welcome to another episode of Politics at the Crossroads, the podcast that sits at the intersection of politics and Christian faith. For episode six, I had the honor of sitting down to speak with Hannah Rich. Hannah is vice chair of Christians on the Left, the organization that supports, resources, and networks Christians involved on the left of politics in the UK. Hannah is also senior researcher at London-based religion and society think tank, Theos. Hannah has researched and written on a range of issues, but most centrally on social and economic inequality. In our conversation, we discussed what Christians have to say on the problem of, and potential solutions to, economic inequality, the effects of the pandemic on the church and its social action, and the immense value and challenge of staying united when we disagree with others, whether in the church or in a political party. I hope that you enjoy the conversation. All right. Well, um, Hannah, yeah, the first question uh, that I want to start off with is looking at uh, where you sit uh, politically and theologically. I wondered if you wouldn't mind just painting a picture of how you've come to to where you sit in in both of those, the story of, of how you've got there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the kind of simple answer to that is that I'm a Christian socialist um, and that can mean a few different things. That means that I'm a Christian, um, that I would define as a socialist, but also that I um, am a Christian socialist kind of as a compound mm. adjective, uh, which is a particular kind of tradition within socialism that, that arose from uh, from Christianity and you know, in the last century. And um, people like R.H. Tawney, who I think were kind of really instrumental, not only in um, in that tradition, but also in kind of the founding of the Labour Party and the, the Labour movement more generally. Um, so that's kind of where I would, would sit. But I also um, I'm quite frustrating for someone trying to ask a question like this um, in that I kind of want Christian and socialist to be enough um, as labels. I kind of have quite a complicated journey of different church traditions that I've been through in my life um, and kind of I'm not 100 percent kind of wanting to nail my colours to one denominational mast as it were um but I, I think christian should be enough in terms of um and i know that's quite might sound quite naive and quite kind of idealistic but actually in terms of how i would define christian is definitely the kind of the top line adjective that i would want to go with um, and likewise socialist i kind of um my my party the labor party has a lot in common with the church in that sense that people really like to to drill down and to label you as being one box within a box within a box um, in the same way that we often do within the church. Actually, in recent years, Labour politics has been the same, that it's not enough to, to say you are on the left um, or in the Labour Party or that you are a socialist. You have to kind of identify with which branch of the party, which side of the party, um, which kind of flavour of left are you? Um, and in the same way that I find the, the obsession with having to kind of defined very narrowly in Christian terms, kind of quite frustrating. Um, I find it quite frustrating when um, people that are in the same party as me want to kind of define by what, what's different rather than what we have in common, which is that we're in the same party. Um, likewise, you know, I think that I have a lot in common with Christian brothers and sisters of all different traditions. Um, and I kind of want to focus on the fact that that is the thing that we have together rather than trying to focus on what, what is different. Um, I guess that's shaped by the fact that I have kind of a huge amount of different Christian traditions that I've experienced, that I've enjoyed, that I've learned from. Um, and so that's kind of shaped my faith in such a rich way that I don't really want to kind of isolate one or other of those. Um, and I think there are people on all wings of my party that I can learn from as well, you know, kind of not just the Labour Party members, but all wings of my kind of political tradition as well. Um, so that's really frustrating for you, you know, ask, asking a question where you want me to kind of focus in on that. But um, yes, I'd begin by kind of taking issue with with the need to, to ask that, I'm afraid. Mm. I mean, how, sort of drilling down slightly, if I can. Um, no, no, it's fine. How, how would you like how, how would you sort of define the left? And was there a moment or an experience uh, in your life that you can point to and say this is what kind of led me to 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 this as a Christian and did your Christian tradition sort of lead you to that as well? Yeah, I think my my politics have always been on the left. Um, I grew up in a, in a family that have always voted Labour and not made a massive kind of song or dance about it. None of my family or party members as such were particularly involved in it. 
Um, but that's always been kind of, um, yeah, I mean, I can remember probably one of my earliest memories actually is the, the 1997 election and mm. um, when I would have been six. Um, and that's one of my kind of earliest um, big historical moments that I can remember, not just my earliest kind of political memory. Um, and I can remember there being a real sense of kind of celebration in our house at that point. Um, and at the time, I don't think I realised quite how momentous it was when I was six years old. But um, it was quite a lot later on that I realised that actually um, having a Labour government was was quite a big a new kind of thing. It wasn't something to take for granted. I mean, there was, you know, I was six in 1997 and then I was pretty much into my 20s before I realised quite how um, momentous that had been in terms of that prior to that it hadn't been a, a taken for granted that uh, Labour would win. But I really remember that sense of celebration in our in our family at the time. But I also remember sort of hearing that my, my granddad, who I, I knew was very left, um, or maybe I didn't know when I was six, but I kind of associated him with um, having similar, similar opinions to my mum on a lot of things, um, was a bit more conflicted because he was very old Labour. Um, he was very, you know, loved Tony Blair and that, that tradition of the Labour Party um, and that kind of tradition of being sort of old school Labour, as you like, and I remember him being a bit conflicted about, you know, yes, it was good that we had a, a Labour government, but it wasn't the one he wanted. And, um, you know, I've, I've since kind of talked to my mum about how she had these really interesting conversations with him at the time about, um, you know, should we be pragmatic and say that, uh, you know, new Labour was, was better than the alternative, um, or could we be really idealistic? And I think my granddad was quite black and white and quite idealistic about this stuff. Um, so, yeah, so I guess I remember 1997 as sort of, um, although that, you know, I wouldn't say I kind of, I knew everything at, the, at that point, like I say, I was six years old, but I can kind of point to that as the, the first time that I remember thinking about this stuff, being aware of it, maybe not thinking about it in any particular depth at all, actually, but um, being being aware of it. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, thing, things can only get better. I think that was that. Exactly. <laughs> Indeed. Um, uh, thank you so much for those reflections, Hannah. Um, and it's really interesting to hear about sort of the, the, the desire for a broad church, both um, in terms of your Christian yeah. faith. I mean, I think we, we, we say that quite often as Christians on the left, as the organisation that I'm um, heavily involved with, I'm the vice chair of, that we are a broad church within a broad church. Um, and we, we really do celebrate that. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's not always an easy thing to do. Um, mm -hmm definitely in the, in, in, last, in the last few years, being um, the broad church within which we are as the, the party has been a really difficult place to try and bang that drum of, um, we, we kind of want, want all sides inv involved. Um, the church is also not always an easy place to do that. But I do think we do that pretty well, um, not to kind of identify anyone kind of personally, but if you think with, if I think about within the, the exec team that I'm, I'm involved with, we definitely don't agree on everything. Um, and I think that's really healthy. There's definitely, you know, we don't get into massive theological debates, but there's huge differences in our theology um, as an executive. Um, and we don't, I dare say, we don't all vote for the same party leader when there's a, a leadership election on either. Um, but we manage that really well. And I think that for me is a fantastic example of how we can be a broad church within a broad church. Um, and I do think we generally, generally do it. Excellent. Thanks very much. I really value you, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just want to move into the, the main section of the conversation, yeah. look at um, the Christian faith and the relationship between that and being on the left. Um, and I know that you've devoted a lot of your work and your thinking and your life to the issue of, of economic and social inequality. Mm -hmm. Now, we're speaking the day after for listeners and viewers, after the budget was announced, the budget of um, Conservative Chancellor Rishi Sunak. I think it would be remiss of me not to ask you about yeah, this, given, given your, your deep thinking on it. Uh, uh, perhaps I can just frame the question um, slightly. So it seems to me that um, the Conservative Party are, are at least trying to, if not successfully, and we can debate um, how, how successfully they're doing this, whether they even should be. Um, uh, I think you and I would probably agree that they should be. They're trying to move into this space occupied by the Labour Party, particularly with the red wall states, uh, seats, excuse me, uh, and now trying to raise taxes and, and move away from austerity in quite a, a big way. You'll no doubt correct me on this, um, but you know, what, what did you make of the budget uh, that was announced yesterday? 
I know it's yeah, no, I think you're you're right that they are moving into that um space of, of caring about these issues and trying to trying to sort of work on tackling geographic inequality specifically the, with the, the sort of the leveling up agenda, um, but kind of indirectly also economic or the other forms of inequality that go with that. Um and I think actually that's quite a, a pragmatic move. I think there has been a shift in the last, uh, well, certainly in the last few years, but particularly since COVID in public um, concern about these things. There was some data out last week, I think from King's in London or from one of the London universities had done some research on public attitudes to inequality in light of COVID um, and found that geographic inequalities were by and large um, or far and away, sorry, the, the biggest form of inequality that the public cared about. Um, and that was the you know, pretty high figures, even when they broke that down by different party voter groups. So it wasn't, they found that all the Labour voters were really interested in this um, and the Conservative ones were less so. I think there's been a sort of, part, partly because of the pandemic, partly because of the, the lasting effects of austerity um, and the combination of those two things. So we were, you know, how well prepared were we for a pandemic should it come along in, in light of 10 years of austerity is it's probably a whole other conversation we could get into. Um, but I think there has been a kind of public awakening in light of those things to the inequalities that have been there for years. We've, we've known that for years. I mean, if you look at kind of the growth in inequality that goes back to the 70s and 80s, that's not since the start of austerity. Um, you know, that's not entirely just due to that. And that's quite that's kind of a, a trend, not only in the UK, but in the US and in other places as well. Um, but I think people are more and more and more aware of it. So I think it's natural that kind of not only the Labour Party, you have historically maybe been more aware of these things, um, both in terms of, of being interested in them, but maybe the particular seats that have historically been Labour um, have been the ones that have been affected by this stuff and therefore Labour MPs have seen that in their casework to a greater extent than Conservative ones. What I think is really interesting now is that those seats that have historically been Labour are in many cases um, now Conservative. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you from North Staffordshire at the moment and the entirety of Stoke was 10 years ago Labour is now entirely Tory. Um, and that has, you know, political implications locally, but it also has um, implications for those MPs and for who, you know, for the different party leaderships and what they're hearing. Um, so all of the issues that affect people living in those seats, and it's not just Stoke, it's, you know, plenty of the red wall seats. Um, that casework was getting heard by the Labour Party and that those, those issues were getting fed into Labour policy where people were struggling with different things. Um, now the Conservatives are getting those in their mailbags as well because they're Tory seats so struggling with the same issues that those, those cities, those towns always have done. Um, and so I think it's, it's inevitable that that has to kind of feed into Conservative policy. It would be, be entirely wrong and... Um, well, not just morally wrong, but, you know, politically stupid not to to kind of to gear towards that, wouldn't it? Mm. What did you make of the budget? I mean, I know the dust still settling. Uh, what were your thoughts on it? If you yeah, don't... the dust is still settling. And I think, you know, the 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 issues of, of corporation tax and all those sort of stuff that people have been discussing is really complicated. Um, I would say I really don't envy from any political angle Rishi Sunak having to make a, a budget in the, in the middle of a pandemic. And I think it is, you know, it is. It's really difficult because we don't know where we're going to be in a few months time and um, I'm not pretending, you know, we're, do we have a, a Labour government making a budget at the moment, we'd have much more clarity because we just don't have the clarity over the next, you know, what, what the economy will look like over the next few months. So, yeah, um, so it's an interesting one and it's a, it's a really difficult job. So I think I'll let the, let the dust settle a little bit before I want to dissect that too much. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, let's zoom out a bit then uh, and look at the issue of economic inequality a bit more broadly. Um, this is something you've clearly spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking here of um, various pieces on, for instance, the sadness of social distancing, perhaps more mm -hmm. on, on the social effects of, uh, of social inequality. Uh, your piece on free school meals and Marcus Rashford, and then um, your uh, report for Theos and the Church Urban Fund growing good published in 2020. I suppose my first question is kind of a basic one. Um, how would you define economic inequality? I mean, in, in really simple terms, it's the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, and the kind of the growth in inequality is the, the growing gap between the extreme, extremely wealthy and the extremely poor, and also the, the coexistence of those things. So whether it's at a global level, um, a national level, or even actually a much more local level, the, the coexistence of 
extreme wealth um, and extreme poverty, uh, which we do often see more than more than you would realise. I kind of um, the story I often tell as to why this is the issue that I've kind of focused on quite so much was in um, I studied abroad for a year during my undergraduate degree and I spent some time in Madrid. Um, and I worked for a, a food bank, an international kind of migrant food bank. There. Um, and the economy in Spain at the time was in a really bad position. So there were these kind of migrant families that were coming to the food bank and they'd come over from Latin America. Um, and their families in Latin America were sending money to Spain because the, the economy was so bad rather than the kind of the reverse, which is normally oh, wow. what you would expect. And they would come to this food bank. And I realised that um, it made me really angry that this was the situation that they were having to come to the food bank. Um, but what really kind of made me quite passionate about this issue was that this this food bank where it was was half a mile from the Real Madrid football ground and half a mile from where quite a lot of the footballers lived. It was their training ground. It was, it was near that near where they lived. And there were these massive houses. Um, and it was not to kind of get too into too much detail, but it was the year that Gareth Bale signed for, for them. And I think for something like 90 million pounds, which was the, the most expensive football has ever been in history. Um, and it was this kind of really weird um, and just incredibly wrong juxtaposition between this most expensive man on the planet being sold and bought for 90 million pounds or however much it was, literally a stone's throw from where I was working with these migrant families. Um, and I think what, what that really kind of crystallized for me was that it wasn't just the fact that the food bank existed that I thought was wrong um, or that I wanted to do something about. Like I think, you know, in isolation, it was a terrible situation that this thing had to exist. Um, but it was also kind of amplified and even more, even more terrible, if it could be, by the fact that it was in such close proximity to the complete extreme. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a story and a picture that I, I think is, is quite vivid in terms of what, what inequality is. So poverty is different because poverty is just kind of the fact that our food bank exists. But inequality, which is a much more and a structural and um, relational, and there's plenty of other kind of issues with it, um, is the fact that they, they exist, not only that they exist, but they exist in that close proximity mm. in the same world and in the same city, uh, in the same suburb in, in some cases. Yeah, they're sort of right, right rubbing up next to one another. That's, that's, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, perhaps moving to um, sort of that's the plight or the problem to, to perhaps the solutions. Um, so I know that you're now working on a new project at, at Theos, uh, looking at um, Christian theology and economic inequality, which sounds absolutely fascinating to me. Um, and you mention, uh, well, on the website, it mentions that the report will seek to build a consensus uh, across biblical perspectives. Um, I, I hope this isn't too cheeky a question, as you're probably writing it now, but I just wondered if there are any hints of what this might look like. You know, um, what do you think... The, the church should be doing to address this issue of economic inequality and and what should it be doing to help those affected by it yeah so i should say that the the work i'm doing at the moment is drawing on a report that we that we already published last year um, by a colleague of mine simon perfect which was kind of an introduction to the church and economic inequality and that um is a brilliant read so i would you know suggest going and reading that um before i give you my kind of half-formed thoughts on the topic which is um kind of not not as as well put together yet as as that report and that report focused a lot in what the, the church could do internally as well as kind of externally um but the work that i'm doing i think you, yeah you're right that we're i'm really hopeful that it can look at um, or it will look at even what theology can offer as that point of consensus um so as we've kind of discussed the left has long been interested in inequality the right is starting to wake up to it and that is correct um, and there is a general kind of public, a general level of public interest in it um, that is that cuts across different political traditions and none. Um, but then the, the the point that is is quite difficult is finding where those those kind of two sides can come together. Um, and actually, I think that is really important, as it is on any issue, if we're going to get real change. Um, but what is really important that is it's, it's not seen as a partisan issue. Um, and I think it is increasingly not seen as a partisan issue, whereas kind of. 10, 20 years ago, those that were talking about inequality were a really small minority, very easily identifiable politically. Um, and with it within um, theology to an extent, if you think about kind of liberation theology, particularly tied to a particular tradition of politics as well. Um, they've been kind of talking about in that tradition of theology has been talking about it for a while, um, but it's definitely not the only 
theological angle on this. Mm. Um, and the hope I think is that Christian theology, because it's such a different perspective and it's one that kind of politicians of both sides or people on both sides of, of the political angle might not necessarily have considered, um, can offer a kind of neither left nor right um, perspective on, on inequality, starting from who we are as people, because I think the kind of the theological and the, the Christian um, conception of who we are is intrinsic to kind of any Christian conception of, of economics, whichever way you want to look at that. Um, and so we're trying to draw out kind of what are some of those principles? Why does that, not only just why does that say inequality is wrong? Um, because I think that is that is fairly established. We, we kind of, we've rehearsed those arguments quite quite well people generally people that are talking about these things generally know why it's wrong um but i think trying to think about not only what theology can offer to the understanding of the problem but potentially to solutions um, and i'm really excited to see what that will look like part of the point is that at the moment i i don't know what those solutions will be and i don't know where we'll get to because we're going to do it kind of deliberatively trying to have that literal consensus getting people in a well, not in a room, but in a Zoom room, hopefully, um, <laughs> together to, to, to hash these issues out. Um, and so actually at this point, I have no idea what that end point will be. Um, and that's really exciting. I have plenty of ideas of kind of what, what I think the introduction might be, what I think kind of the, the starting point of, this is what theology says about inequality is. Um, but in terms of where that will get us in kind of consensus driven ideas and solutions and possibilities, I, I don't actually know at the moment, which is, yeah. Uh, really exciting I think but, and daunting as well. But. Yeah, absolutely I look, look forward to hearing what you come up with. I mean one of the things I've been thinking about on this issue is in, in terms of solutions as well is um, you know what is the what how do we frame the solution to economic inequality is it economic equality is it proportionality is it um, uh, justice uh, mm -hmm. that, that's that's a question I've been wrestling with and especially reading someone like um, Jonathan Haidt, where he talks about the different moral receptors that we have mm -hmm. uh, across the political spectrum where um, uh, justice is framed in, in, in different ways um, by, uh, as he puts it, liberals, I suppose, might equate more to progressives and conservatives um, in the, on the political spectrum. But I, anyway, I, I'll say that I, I look forward to hearing, hearing what yeah. you come up with on this, on this question. Yeah, I mean, the question of kind of inequality of or equality of what is a whole part of this as well. Are we talking? I mean, I don't I don't for a second think that where we'd get to is the point that um, everyone should have exactly the same income, exactly the same wealth. I don't think that would be a particularly consensus friendly um, position to, to get to, even if you know some people might want to argue that. But I actually don't think that's kind of the end goal of resolving inequality anyway, um, because that's a kind of a very very kind of pie in the sky kind of potentially pie in the sky sort of solution to it um but are we talking inequality of income wealth resources access to stuff access to particular resources um, and then there's a whole other conversation about what well, what should those be you know what is what is the good life i mean aristotle had different ideas on that and people have used that aristotelian idea of the good life throughout um and that i think has a lot to to offer to this conversation as well because that might look different in different contexts. People might have different conceptions of that, um, but actually you could build a conception of the good life, which doesn't inc include having the same amount of money, or which isn't contingent on having X amount of money, um, but is access to particular things, whether they are a house, um, healthcare, you know, whatever, whatever those are. And we could build a kind of vision of inequality or equality, um, which is equality of access to those things, hmm. equality of, capacity to have that sort of a life um, and you could have that sort of a life and you could achieve that on a million pounds or on a hundred thousand pounds or on ten thousand pounds um, if it was constituted in such a way that 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 is possible so I think it's kind of again that's one of the things that I think philosophy and theology can can bring to this is not thinking of it in purely although it's economic inequality we're looking at not thinking of it economistically just in terms of the economy the economics of it but thinking as well about what, what else might we, we bring into that. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, I remember um, hearing John Barclay, a New Testament scholar, talk about um, the notion of reciprocity as well. And he, um, I mean, just uh, kind of drawing on what you're saying there about the drawing on kind of philosophy and theology. And he um, spoke a lot about relational 
inequality or relational uh, poverty mm -hmm. and how actually um, in, uh, I mean, it's a generalization, but often working class communities is a, a relational, um, the relational riches there that, um, you know, that communities where there's a, a sort of economic disparity and a relationship might occur between say a wealthier community or a wealthy individual in, in a different community to that working class community actually both have something to offer in that relationship and often when we think of it just in terms of economic disparity it's, it can it can almost increase that whereas you know, this community has something relational to offer which I thought was was, was interesting um, and perhaps that leads me on to, the, to, 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 to my next question which is how is your own Christian faith you've touched on this has your own Christian faith motivated you uh, in devoting yourself to, to to the issue of economic inequality and, and the solutions that you think there might be? Yeah, I think um, it's it's been the kind of the driving factor very much in why I've done why I've had the career that I've had thus thus far. Although it's not you know it's not been that many years, um, and then I, I kind of always knew that I wanted to do something that would. Be, be a force for good in the world if that doesn't sound too too grand in terms of my little my little contribution to it um and I think that was very much driven by by my Christian faith by um churches that I've been involved in you know as a student when I was thinking about what I wanted to do when I graduated that was justice was at the heart of that and whatever that looked like I didn't really know at that time um and I think you know in, in a very personal sense kind of every every time I've applied for a job or every sort of step that I've, I've taken um, has been something that I've prayed quite a lot about and has felt like the right thing. Um, and that's kind of led me down paths that I never expected that I would go down in places that I never thought I would end up. Um, and the only kind of possible explanation I can have for that is that it was, it was God in the sense that, um, I mean, I studied languages and I think I remember yeah, I remember being a student and praying these big grand prayers that you do when you're a student about how you'll you'll go wherever God sends you and you'll go and go to the ends of the earth. And I think, you know, everyone prays those things when they're 19 and really earnest or maybe not everyone, but kind of, yeah, it's quite it's quite a common thing, isn't it? And I remember thinking that I'm being like, right, this is definitely going to mean Latin America, Argentina. This, this is, you know, the ends of the earth is going to be really literal in this because why else am I studying languages? Um and then kind of a few years later, I kind of reflected on it and was like, I never thought at that point that the, the difficult place that God would call me to be active would be Westminster. Um, you know, you think of like, well, I'll go somewhere really hard for you, God, I'll go somewhere really difficult. And you think of like really difficult places in, in poverty and in, in kind of the ends of the earth. Um, but Westminster is a really difficult place to work and to be, not in terms of my paid job, I should say, in kind of, you know, not, not that specifically working at Theos is difficult, but, um, you know, the, my work with Christians on the left and stuff, and, and, and I love it. Um, and I definitely think it's it's what I'm called to. But it's such a kind of beyond my wildest dreams when I was 18 and beyond anything I even would have imagined then. Um, that I think in a very literal sense, that's been been guided by God, as well as kind of ideologically, that's the sort of thing that I found myself wanting to be in because of my Christian faith. So I think it's it's both there. Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks very much. Um, turning to just the final uh, kind of big topic within this section, um, and this is looking at the sort of elephant in the room, which is we're, we're recording this in, in lockdown uh, mm -hmm. with COVID pandemic. I just looked like to look at um, and hear your thoughts on the effects of the pandemic and lockdown on, on social action, uh, both in the charity sector and um, uh, with the churches. Uh, this is something that you can you can speak to given um, your research for growing good. Mm -hmm. So I remember seeing the map in the Theos uh, office. Yeah. The, 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 you did something like 300 inter 350 interviews and yeah, yeah. 60 parishes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of train tickets. Um, a lot of train tickets. That feels like a whole other world now getting on trains. Yeah. Yeah. I guess much of that was done pre-COVID pre or BC before COVID. Yeah. But as I understand it, part of it was done under the shadow of the virus as well, or, or the tail end. And certainly you touch on that in your reports on, on the effects of uh, lockdowns and COVID on, uh, on the, the social action of churches and, and so on. I just wondered, um, what did you see and hear uh, in terms of the personal effects of the pandemic mm -hmm. and uh, restrictions 
on the work of churches and charities um, in, in their local in their local communities and the work that they were doing. Yeah, it was a really interesting one, and I think in the same way that that anyone that was coming to the end of a project or a bit of work this time last year suddenly had that sense of is it going to be all completely irrelevant because we're going into to lockdown and COVID. I mean, I'd finished the research, um, the the interview part of the research in December, December of twenty nineteen pretty much a week before anyone had ever heard of coronavirus at all um, and there was that kind of panicky sense of I've spent two and a half years writing this like re researching this thing I'm now going to have to write it in a lockdown in which the entire world is kind of being you know turned on its head or in a pandemic where nothing is as it was um, and I mean I'm not wasn't the only one in that position that kind of everything that we'd known up to that point was then changed and then what, what did that mean for this report that I was trying to write based on stuff that had happened before um, but I think it was really interesting thinking and seeing how some of the stuff that I've been looking at in terms of the church's social action was more relevant rather than less because of the pandemic, certainly the need for it. And I actually remember this time last year, I'd written this kind of draft of an introduction saying, you know, 2019 was um, the highest year for food bank use that we've ever had. Um, and that was, you know, that was growth on 2018. And that was, you know, 2019 was this record breaking year. Um, with absolutely no clue that kind of just around the corner was was a lockdown and 2020 would be, um, you know, dwarf 2019's demand on food banks. And that's only one particular example of the church's social action, obviously. Um, and I think 2021 is probably going to look like that's considered. That's kind of continued even. Um, and I also remember interviewing someone who'd said, you know, in, in two, two or three years time, we will we'll not be here. Um, in terms of the food bank literally would be done out of a job. That was their dream that kind of speaking in I guess 2018 2019 they were hopeful that by early 2020s there, there would be no need for food banks um and that was really you know reading back through that thinking wow they they kind of did have this hope then that um the the social need and the kind of the material need for, for what they provide brilliant as it is that they provide it um wouldn't wouldn't be there long term and then we saw this pandemic come along and just you know whatever um whatever kind of policies had been put in place, there was going to be a level of economic difficulty that was increased because of that. Um, and I think that's true across the board. So all the different things that churches do, food banks are very much only one example of them. You know, churches do work on kind of debt counselling. Well, that's only going to grow. And then some of the kind of the pastoral stuff that churches do, so mental health provision, um, whether that's formal or informal as well, you know, kind of just the, the conversations and the kind of the social engagements that that happen in church and the social interactions that church social action provides the need for those has only grown um and the need for those things to be even more innovative because they want to carry on providing what they were doing they can't do it in a building um you know maybe maybe things will happen on zoom maybe you know basically everything about church life was kind of thrown up into the air and had to be kind of innovated and reinvented um and i think there's been some brilliant examples of that happening but it's a strange kind of there's, you know, everything is changing at the time that the need for what we we're already doing is only growing. You know, we, we would be still running more food banks in the kind of traditional sense if we were still able to do that. And that everything being so kind of difficult at the same time as actually a lot of. So this was one of the things that, that we found in the bit of the research that we did during COVID um, was a slight kind of discrepancy, I guess. In the, in the numbers, so it was a small scale sample. So I'm not claiming this is kind of everywhere. There's, there was some complexities in trying to do a survey under COVID as well. Um, but th there was a gap between the, the proportion of churches and congregations who felt that they would be um, more aware of their community's needs after the pandemic compared to before. Um, so quite a lot of the, ma the majority said, yes, we will be kind of more aware of our community's needs, um, but not but a lot fewer or a much lower percentage um, said that they would be better prepared or better in a, in a better position to, to serve those. Um, and I think that was a degree of kind of realism from people saying, we're going to be even more aware of what is going on and how we're needed, but actually we're not going to have suddenly a massively greater volunteer capacity, particularly not to, to stereotype particularly, but a lot of these projects are staffed by people who are retired, people who are older, who are fantastic and wonderful and faithful and had to shield um, because mm -hmm. of their age, because of, you know, even 
yeah. because they were over 70 or whatever. And so that sense of, yes, we're needed more than ever. We don't have as many people. And that what will that look like long term, um, I think, is really interesting. And that, yeah, so that's something that that, that came up, that, that sense that um, at the point when I finished the research, it felt like, you know, the need for the church's social action is the greatest. It's maybe not the greatest it's ever been, but certainly the greatest it's been in, in my lifetime. Um, and I would have confidently written that at the end of 2019. Had I been finishing the report then, I would have confidently said, you know, food bank use is at its highest. The church is needed more than ever. Um, actually, six months later, I wrote those sentences again. Or I still wrote those sentences, but they had a completely different meaning than what I would have imagined them to have meant. In 2019 rather than 2020. Yeah. One of the things, the solutions that you, or recommendations that you mentioned at the end of the report is um, a Church of England National Volunteer Service, I think it was. Um, I just wondered, you know, what are you, perhaps looking more constructively to the future, what are your hopes for the church, for social action in a, in a post-COVID world, or, or perhaps even kind of more close to home right now as mm. we're in it? I think in terms of very specifically in terms of church and social action so that's the the stuff that I've um researched I haven't you know done any research on online church services or any of that stuff so I can't really speak so much to that um but I think my hope would be that the church is more confident in the value of its social action um I think it's sometimes sometimes been a little bit kind of diffident about it at a local level um, but actually we've seen how how critical and how um, vital it has been certainly at a, you know we can have the conversation and the conversation has been had um, I think about whether the national church got it right throughout this crisis um, and I'm not going to kind of wade into that one but I think at a local level the, the church really has stepped up in a very practical sense right. I think it's interesting that um, while people might and have knocked the church of England at large for um, for its response in various ways very few people I think would have a negative thing to say about their local incarnation of the church you know people who are not in the church know very well that um St John's up the road is where the food bank is or you know that church down there is where the toddler group used to happen and actually they've done they've done this and that and the other so I think at a, at a local level the church can be really and should be really confident in its capacity to serve its community um, and that's kind of where the the volunteer service idea that you you mentioned came in um, it was not necessarily something that we would expect to be adopted wholesale but it was more about sort of starting that conversation that at the start of the first lockdown there was that nhs volunteer responder something service that got That's set up um, and like a million people signed up for that and i got friends that you know were not involved in volunteering at all before were not particularly i wouldn't say they weren't socially minded but they weren't doing anything like that before definitely weren't christians um, who signed up for that and never got a phone call and I thought that was really interesting because you know a million people wanting to do something good and it might be because you know a large number of them it was because they were furloughed wanted to use that time well fine um, but a million people it's fantastic that this many people that are not less not the majority not involved in volunteering already then just didn't get asked um, and it certainly wasn't because there wasn't a the need there you know it wasn't that there were you know there were a million people there twiddling their thumbs and there was nothing for them to do it was that the the context in which that was set up kind of didn't didn't match so the nhs or the system whoever you know set up that structure and um, didn't have that local coordinating power of knowing where those people could be well you know well used which the church has you know and if you'd have said to any local church there are 17 people in your parish you've signed up to this system how can you use them and i'm not saying it has to be the church doing that but the church could have done that um, my, I would wager that the vast majority of local churches would have found jobs or things, you know, even if it's phone calls or doing shopping or whatever, the, the local church would have been better placed, I think, to use that volunteer capacity. Um, not just in a, in a church sense, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter in that sense that the people volunteering were not involved in the church at all. The church would have, would have known where to send them um, in a way that the NHS system, just by, just by its nature, by being start, started from scratch, in a crisis, you know, at a national level, trying to then work backwards to the local level. It just didn't work. Um, but I think it would be really sad as a, as a country, not just for the, for the church kind of stepping away from the church, if that kind of groundswell of volunteer capacity of a million people in this country wanting to do something, um, and you know, it might be because they have more time on their hands, fine. But kind of if that was lost 
just lost and they said you know I signed up to do that thing but I never got asked and that's the end of my being socially minded journey or when the pandemic's over they kind of go back to to not using that so I think the the volunteer service thing was definitely trying to kind of capitalize on that or maybe that's not the right word but you use that kind of um growing enthusiasm for community and social action in, in a more constructive way than um than the kind of the national service did at present or last year i don't think it exists anymore but yeah i remember signing up for that there seems to be a real grand swell of energy um i think the more successful uh idea was the these sort of whatsapp local groups yeah um, and they were so organic as well they weren't you know governmentally governmentally you know instigated or whatever um and they actually there was some some really interesting research done by i can't remember who it was new local perhaps i can't quite remember um that said the majority of those those local mutual aid groups were driven by people who were on furlough um and they so they had they were people who just didn't have the time before they weren't the usual suspects um who you know the people that are volunteering and everything and have them for, for decades um the way the church often has that kind of the usual suspects the people who are on every road to blah 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 um actually the, the majority of mutual aid groups and whatsapp groups and community stuff that started during the pandemic was run by people who weren't running things before but i think that's probably a lesson that not only as a church but as a as a country we should maybe learn going forward what does it look like to have you know, working lives that better able us to, to volunteer as well. You know, it suggests that if these people are on furlough and actually want to do something with that time, it was because they didn't have the time before rather than because they didn't have the, the will. So mm. what would it look like to restructure our working life that we had more time for that? What would it look like to have a kind of civil society within the church and without that isn't just based on the usual suspects, isn't just based on the people that always volunteer, that enables kind of a wider number of people and a wider range of people to be involved. That's a really interesting study that it was uh, a sort of new group of people with, uh, as you say, un- a sort of untapped potential there. Um, I, I, yeah, I would love to hear more about that study and maybe um, get a copy off here or something at, at later points. Um, just the final question, Hannah, which is one um, inspired by the name of the series. So looking at uh, the, the crossroads of faith and politics uh, in a more constructive, positive fashion. Um, so the question is really twofold. First, what do you think your faith tradition or Christianity more broadly can learn from your political tradition? And secondly, what can your political tradition learn from Christianity or your faith tradition more specifically? Yeah, I think I'll come full circle on this one and answer kind of where I started. Um, in that I think the answer to to both of those is the value of unity and the the potential for it. So I think in a really practical way, um, being involved in a church on one hand teaches you to to live alongside people who are not like you, done done, done at its best. Being in a church community is being with people who you you don't agree with on everything. Um, And that's very much the same as being in a political party, Um, you know, being... And as well, in a very practical sense, being in the Labour Party with people who I disagree with kind of has helped me to to then have that experience in church as well. Um, So I think that that sense of being able to to live alongside people, to coexist in the same organisation as people who share some of the same strong values, ideals, beliefs as you, but not all of them. And for that to be okay, I think is something that is um, not done well, both done well and not done well in both the organisations that we're talking about, right? So the church does that well and the church gets it really wrong on that. The Labour Party has, can do it well and um, more often than not doesn't do it well, I think, that not not being kind of factional within, within a faction or within a party. Um, so I think that very practical, it is possible to to live alongside people like that. And also, I think, a sense of not giving up and um, so I often joke that being being in church and being in the Labour Party and being um, a supporter of a not particularly good at the moment football team um, feed it feed into each other really well because I don't give up on any of those when things are bad or when one thing goes wrong um, it's Southampton before you ask um, but, <laughs> um, but I, you know I don't I don't quit supporting Southampton when we look when we're on a run like we are at the moment and it really feels like I should um, Likewise, I don't 
and many, many people do, but I don't feel called to kind of lead, leave the Labour Party, leave my political tradition when the people in charge are not people who I particularly would, would agree with. Um, that's been the experience over the last few years, definitely, that kind of I have found a way to, to stay in the party, to stay involved in, in Labour politics anyway, um, and to still find hope in that, even when kind of not everything is going the way I would want it to or hope it would. Um, and I think the same is true of the church as well, that if we're people of faith and we're people who are committed to um, to the kingdom and to Christianity at large, well, then we don't kind of walk away from stuff when it when it gets difficult. So I think kind of that that's something that the, you know, being involved in faith and politics. Um, and I think that that's probably true, whatever your faith, whatever your politics. But it's certainly true for me as a Christian on the left that that the sense of staying power, the sense of it being worth having hope, sticking around, persevering and learning to love people that you don't agree with um, definitely feeds into each other. Um, and I think plenty of people could could learn from that. So a sense of unity, but a, a hard one unity. Super hard, very much a hard one unity that, you know, being a broad church in a broad church is is hard one. Mm. It's not something that happens accidentally. It's something that you have to really commit to and believe in and we do as an organization and we do it I think as I said really really pretty well um but it's not it's not by any stretch easy um and I think people in church know that and I think people in the party hopefully know that um but I think those those two experiences definitely enrich each other rather than um challenging fantastic well I think that brings me to the end of my question so thanks so much for giving your time oh, you're welcome it's been great I'll uh, stop recording there um, that button great